it's scary too because it makes you wonder how many decisions in the history of the world have been made based on based on group think and how many incorrect decisions have been made you know based off of that almost you could sum it up as peer pressure almost as the most simple way to, to explain it Welcome back to the Out of the Box podcast, where Steel and I, Jose, your host, get to talk about outside of the box ideas. Today, we're going to be talking about Steel. Social psychology, weird stuff you may not know. Yeah. Yeah. So we're just going to go into different avenues today, um, and we'll see where this podcast leads us. Um, and for those who are new to our channel, this is a channel where we focus on talking about different topics all across the board where we primarily look at them from the philosophical lens, the psychology lens, and then the theological lens. So we try to combine all these three into one. And so if this sounds like something you would be interested in, feel free to subscribe to our channel uh, so that you continue to have content every week. So without further ado, Stu, if you want to let us know about the first topic or the first avenue so, that you um, think is weird. Have you ever heard about the spotlight effect before? No, no. So it's like the idea in social psychology that like, uh, like people feel like everyone's watching them. Like when they walk into mm. a classroom or walk into a public place, they feel like they're kind of people are like watching them more closely than they actually are. When in reality. Yeah. Everyone else is, has the spotlight effect too. So they're probably worried about what other people think about them. And are they watching what they're doing? Like, so if like someone trips in a mall, like, or makes a small mistake in class, they might think people are noticing more than they actually are. Yeah, Being on the it's true. Yeah, I, I think I've definitely come to realize that more recently as well, because sometimes as I am here in my apartment by myself, I am in my house, the protagonist of the story. But then when I walk out of my house and start driving in the streets, then I realize I am not a protagonist per se. I am just another human being. Right. And I do realize that though, that there is times when I walk into a room and I feel like I am the center of attention. And sometimes I guess it has to do also with the fact that I entertain parties. So uh, it is very common for me to walk in and people see balloons, they automatically feel attracted or they, they look at me and they they feel drawn to get a balloon or they want to come over right and so yeah, yeah. there's this constant attention that because of the nature of my work i feel it attracts people's eyes so i have this concept in my head that when i walk into a party sometimes i feel like a prota protagonist right. feeling another... like i'm drawing attention yeah. or i feel like the 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 kid is the protagonist but i become like one of the main characters in the story of this party. In some sense, we're all the protagonists of our own life, I guess you could say. You know, it's just, but then at the broader picture of things, we're all just side characters, I guess, almost. Or we're just, we're just individuals, or maybe there's no reason to overthink it. We're just, you know, we're just human beings and people. And, but yeah, like, you know, like if you ever had like a stain on your shirt or clothes and you thought people would notice more than they did or, yeah like an example yeah or like you feel like people are watching your every move and so it kind of makes you almost feel kind of nervous like like in like in like i remember my first day of middle school that's exactly how i felt i felt like everyone was noticing my every move and so i had so much anxiety in my first day of school in the classroom just sitting there it felt like every move i made the paper that i moved on my desk or something made like the loudest noise you know in my yeah head. that's what it felt like when in reality everyone's probably feeling that way and people are probably focusing on their own problems in their own little world rather than you you know there's no reason to believe 
that everyone's focusing on you in any given moment you know unless unless you are like you know like like you said doing balloon art or on stage you know what i mean but exactly so really and i think about it also right now i'm watching the mandalorian new season oh yeah and sometimes the man mandalorian is the protagonist but then in this mandalorian episode that i was watching it turned the spotlight into the doctor that oh, was yeah somebody else and so that character now becomes the protagonist of this side story that's strange so in a sense i think later on they will merge those two stories almost like the avengers every superhero is the protagonist of their own story but in the avengers they all come together and there's no real protagonist all of them serve a need to the story so that's probably how i am able to to understand this spotlight idea but it does make sense how we in general tend to see our problems and things going on in our life as big or they seem over exaggerated bigger than they are because we think that we are on a spotlight exactly yeah and it kind of it ties in with the other interesting one called the illusion of transparency because that one's kind of similar because with that one it says the illusion of transparency means that most people think that other people can see their emotions more than they actually are so like you think that people can pick up on what you're feeling more than what they really can pick up so like if you feel sad you'll think that people will notice that you're sad but in reality people probably don't notice as much as you think they do you know because mm. yeah like same thing with if you're angry you may think people are noticing that you're angry when in reality they probably don't you know so that's where the trans the illusion of transparency like we think our emotions are more transparent than they really are. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Weird. I'm not sure if I have a particular story that coincides with with that. But do you do you happen to I feel have like, something that? Yeah, one of my aligns with it. So when my biological dad passed away, like back in college, halfway through college. I thought people would notice that I was more upset or dealing with that more so than they actually did, you know, like that they would pick up on it more. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's the closest I can, I think I can get to like, mm -hmm. or, or like anxiety. So like, I'm sure there's plenty of times in school when I felt like people noticed me being more nervous. Like I thought people could see the anxiety I was feeling inside more than they probably actually were, especially when giving a presentation. Like you have stage fright or something, and people, mm. like what if people notice I'm shaking or nervous? You know. Yes, I think I've definitely oh, yeah. had those experiences where I feel that people think that I'm very nervous, which I am, but that they can probably see it. Right. Probably not more not recently, because now I can go to a party or an event and know that people are looking at me but it doesn't make me nervous and a lot of people ask me if i feel weird or nervous when a lot of people are looking at me while i work but i just come to the understanding that it's part of the nature of what i do right so people are looking at me not because they're pressuring me but because they feel wowed or they feel yeah. you're the entertainment that i'm taking them their imagination to a new place of yeah. what is actually capable i imagine you've probably gotten used to it over the years right like like you know being that kind of entertainment with the balloon art like yeah like you're not really nervous about it anymore you just kind of like normal thing like yeah, yeah. and you know what it actually having worked in this this for a while now 
has actually not only gotten me outside of my box of comfort zone, how I talk to people, but it made me realize how some people just don't really care. Yeah. Because when when something happens in my life and somebody asks me, how are you doing? Or what's going on? A lot of people don't tend to, unless they're really good friends, they really don't want to hear what's going on in your life. Right. That's true. It's kind of like, just want to hear, hey, it's going well. Life is good. It's like a re- reflectual instinct to just say, how are you doing? You know, it's not like they exactly. Want- it's not like they really want to know how you're doing. Yeah, because if you say, oh, man, my life is horrible and this and this happened, they're probably going to be put off. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they they just don't want to hear that kind of stuff. Yeah, a lot of so people, you, know? you come to a realization how some people really just don't care. And maybe it doesn't mean that they don't care at all. Right. But they just don't care at that moment. Yeah, because perhaps of the spotlight um, idea yeah. that you know they're the the protagonist in their own story, so You're this just person. seems like a side problem that side quest. don't have to deal with yeah. exactly. But it's like also like thinking about different factors. Like some people aren't social. Some people have social anxiety. Some people are depressed. Some people are dealing with their own problems that they don't have time to deal with other people's, or they're focused on their own struggles, or they are they're just they don't care about people that's another possibility or they're just really busy in that moment don't have enough time they're on a time crunch in that moment so you know and that's stressful so what happens when someone's stressed they're more likely to come off in a in the wrong way basically and they might be trying to hide that they don't want you to know they're stressed but they're going to show it you know with how they respond so yeah it all there's a lot of complicated factors there um, this next one's probably gonna either blow your mind or you'll be like, nah, that makes sense. I could see that. It's called mm. group groupthink. We may have learned about this in our communication. Mm. Communication. Yeah, I remember groupthink. It's like uh Irving Janice, a psychologist, discovered that apparently, and that members of a group go with what most group members think rather than what the correct answer or decision is in that moment. So let's say, let's think of a crazy example. And I'm sure I'm probably this is probably part of some thought experiment that someone thought of, so I'm not taking credit for it. But this, I kind of remember something like this, like people in a room, right, in like an important conference room and they're making decisions about the world. And they say, for some crazy reason, we need to launch nuclear missiles against two countries or three countries or whatever. Uh, and let's say like maybe, like most, all the, most of the group members agree, but let's say there's like three group members out of 10 that are like, no, this is a horrible idea. This is immoral. It's unethical. But they end up agreeing because most of the other group members agree. And their fear of like retaliation or or peer pressure or just the moment or the experience, they feel like they have to go along and agree kind of thing. And this is yeah. experiments too. So it's a very real thing that can happen. Yeah, I'm sure that that could happen also when trying to solve problems i realized that within a community of people the extroverts will talk first sometimes leaving the introverts who perhaps know the right answer to not speak but the introverts will easily sometimes just follow along to what the extroverts said so a good leader learns to hear the introverts and the extroverts because he knows that the extroverts will automatically talk first, but makes room for the introverts to feel comfortable expressing themselves. Definitely, yeah. So those are really interesting points. I think, for example, a a funny story or funny sure. um, example would be there's people in a cave that are trapped by rocks oh the plate yeah let's say for example that one and they some people say well let's let's just use our arms and we can probably uh if if we push hard enough 
we can move these boulders. And so everybody in the group think agrees with that. And so they start pushing until they realize that it needs more force to actually move these rocks. And so they say, well, we should probably eat someone in order to, to survive. <laughs> Yeah. Groupthink could potentially lead to the yeah. aspect of actually eating someone yeah. nice. as, as a as a as a decision. Yeah, so Even though there more. might be another exit in the other side of the cave. Right. That that was there that they didn't know of. But that's that's interesting yeah. that even though there we haven't exhausted all our options. It's scary too because it makes you wonder how many decisions in the history of the world have been made based on based on groupthink, and how many incorrect decisions have been made. You know, based off of that, almost you could sum it up as peer pressure, almost as the most simple way to to explain it. Yeah, that's kind of makes. Yeah, sure. and that's why people in high school and middle school end up yeah. doing things that they regret doing right. because other people who were in the group, they decided that that was the right thing to do in general for everyone. So everybody had to do it. It goes along with it. Takes a lot right? of strength to overcome that peer pressure. Yeah. It is. And honestly, a lot of the innovators of society tend to flee from groupthink, if that makes sense. Mm, because like they go against the grain. Yeah. They go against the grain. Yes. If you look at it in terms of a circle, right? This is the circle of comfort. And most innovators tend to fall outside of this circle because new ideas have to be searched for. They have to be, in order for them to be new, they have to take from what's already comfortable and expand on it so yeah. that when the innovator shows the mainstream community that it is a possibility or, or there's this new device that they created that improves life, whatever it might be, then that general circle of comfort grows. And that's why innovators, artists, they push the society forward and expand it because they're the ones that, that, go outside and search the new boundaries so that they feel people feel comfortable walking into those boundaries. It's almost like it's very primitive actually, because you have these explorers in the community who will go out and find food. They would look at, they would travel before people actually moved with them so that they were always ahead so that in case one of them died, not everyone died, mm. right? Only one person would die instead of everybody moving together as a herd, then there's more potential of more people dying because they didn't know if that particular area was safe. So there was people that needed to scout the areas ahead of time in order to make sure the people who are following along behind them were were safe. Yeah. So it's almost like the wolves, right? You always have at the front, you have the main wolf, and then at, at the end you have the the weakest wolf, but still serves a purpose because they're they're looking from afar how everyone's doing. But the wolf from the front is the strongest wolf or the wisest, the the leader, because he is pushing forward, moving forward. And if somebody has to protect the, the whole community of wolves, it has to be the first one. So he is the first one to take a hit mm -hmm. in, in terms of uh, protecting. Um, yeah. So it's, it, it's, it's similar to that group think. So innovators are always outside, you know, exploring and scouting new ideas so that when they do find something, then they can bring it to the community and the circle of comfort expands to a new understanding of what's possible. 
um, and create a general consensus of what life is or looks like. Yeah. So leaders take more risks, you know, yeah. Because yeah. it's risky to, to be innovative and to think of a new idea to go against the grain that does take risk. Yeah. You know, even, if, even if it requires, for example, in the, the story about the people stuck in the cave with the rocks, perhaps the innovator would be the one that would go back into the cave. And even though it's dark, they would try to find another exit before actually trying to kill someone for food. So in that sense, the innovator has more bravery and courage. Yeah. It takes risk. Um, and that's what we do, even as an artist. That's why sometimes it is very hard for innovators and artists. And a lot of people don't see this, how, how much it takes from someone to actually sit down and think of something new, think of create something new, because it is a scary process dwelling into new territory not knowing if it's going to work out, not knowing if you're just wasting your time. Right. So it is a risk. Yeah, retaliation, not being accepted, all those things. But if someone doesn't yeah. care about retaliation or doesn't care about whether they're accepted by others, then they'll be more willing to take the risk because it doesn't phase them to do that. But then it also reminds me of the, the ash conformity line experiment, like the famous one. You ever hear about that? No. So it was like a group of people, it was an experiment, and these group of people were shown different uh, lengths of lines. And uh, some of the participants were actually researchers pretending to be a participant, and they purposely said the wrong answer. So most of the people in the group said the wrong answer on purpose when, the, when they were asking which line is the longest and which one's the shortest. So they would purposely say like the wrong you know, answer, of course, and then so the other two who are real participants in a fair amount of cases, in a significant number of cases, even though they knew it was so obvious that these people were saying the wrong answer, they actually went along and said the wrong answer too. They conformed because most of the group conformed. Yeah. Even though they wow. knew. Wow. That is impressive. Very powerful. So everybody is, is there. Everybody hears the answers from everybody else. So it's like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like they're sitting in like a classroom almost like at a long table and like the majority of them are actually experimenters and they're saying the wrong answer on purpose. And then there's like a few participants and they end up going along with it, even though they know it's wrong because they hear them wow. say the first, you know, so. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Not everyone did it, but it was significant. So a fair amount did. It just shows the power of conformity. Yeah. In like you were saying, how many decisions in in life and history have been made with this in mind? Exactly, with conformity. Even even when we look at society today and we know that there's relativism going on. Mm -hmm. For example, I don't want to get too deep into these topics because I know they can be um, issues, but you cannot walk up to me and tell me I am a three foot Chinese woman. Yeah. It, but I nowadays, a lot of people can say, I am a woman when they're a man and they're stuff like that. I think that it's obvious what, what is true in nature, but psychologically, it can be confused or understood another way just because people in general decide to conform or to this idea. So How do you think? The, there's a lot of things nowadays in society that can, can have happened because of groupthink, a mass community of people believe this is true. So a lot of people just accept that even though they don't agree or maybe they don't see the, the truth in it because they want to be accepted and be received in the community, they just conform to what is there. 
And isn't that how new beliefs are formed in a society, right? Like new cultural beliefs and new movements are almost started like that with groupthink, you know, like a chain reaction. Yeah. When people start believing it, it starts catching on more and more in society. And then it develops into a new belief system. Mm. What if, what if, um, what if it could be used for good? Yeah, it could I be. mean, because I, I think about this and sure. in groupthink, for example, there's there's this volleyball organization that's going on here in San Antonio. And we honestly invite anyone who would like to play. The majority of the people are Catholic. But there has been a few people in the community that have converted to Catholicism because they see the good acts of people and they see the community and they are drawn to it. When before, if it would have just been a friend who was Catholic, perhaps they wouldn't have been motivated to convert. But since now they have a group of 800 people who all abide by Catholicism, then those people who are getting integrated feel like that is the way to go. So even perhaps if at the beginning they don't question it that much, perhaps there is a a, a way to actually motivate or promote ideas that are good and get people to latch on to them. Yeah. I mean, that's how ideas spread, you know? Yeah. yeah. That's how new ideas spread, how new cultural beliefs spread, all that sort of stuff. Uh, trends, anything like that. Yeah. And I think nowadays, social media is definitely... Yeah, now we have... Uh, yes, a place where... Because before, the news channels were the ones that were sometimes what pushed the society right? What's going on in the world. But now when you have YouTube and you can have different perspectives on one topic, then you can, as a consumer, you can say, okay, well, this person says this, this person says this, this doesn't match, or actually these three sources do match. So there's more certainty here because these are reputable sources. And this one is reputable, but then you you can start kind of looking at the truth yeah it can lead to a lot of confusion too if you have so many ideas at once and you don't know which one's true which i think that's true we're in a war of ideas cultural ideas right now and society is confused and sometimes we don't have time to to really fact check things yeah that's true too and then but then if even if you fact check people still claim that your facts are just opinions or your facts aren't true my facts are true and so like it's still a war of which which one's facts are true. Is it this person or this person? You know, I think that's what's going on right now is truth is up in the air and no one really knows what it is anymore. It's real mm. Yeah. Well, it's been the the same problem since Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? Exactly, yeah. It's not anything new that we've been trying to find truth. Yeah, I perfect. think if we were all really trying to find truth without being overly taking it personal or or being too aggressive. And we could actually reach truth together. We have a discussion. Yes. That's what we need. In a discussion, in a, in a, in a debate. Just what's going on on the internet. That's for sure. Do do you think like, I, I definitely think with the internet, since it's removed the, the physical aspect yeah. where you are not actually in front of a person Safe. when you're having a debate, yeah. then you can get more heated yeah. in an online text oh, yeah. conversation, yeah. even even the fact that it's not through voice. Yeah, right. No fear of retaliation because the you're safe behind a computer screen. You don't have to worry about that anymore. So you can say whatever you want in however harsh terms you want to. And, yeah. yeah, because my name on online is uh pinocchio 325 power of anonymity too exactly yeah people who are anonymous are more likely to you know do stuff like that 
for sure. There's one other thing I want to throw in there in our last section uh, is like the fundamental attribution error. So this one's really, it sounds kind of like, ah, it's kind of boring, but it's actually really interesting. So like this is the theory that people are more likely to attribute the cause of someone's behavior to the person's personality traits rather than the situation that that person is in. So here's a quick example to kind of help uh, the audience and us understand it. Someone has road rage. You see a driver, he's got road rage and they're all mad and stuff and yelling or whatever. What's well, like the first thing you're gonna think about that driver? Like, oh, that must be a really angry person. You're, you're, you're attributing a personality trait to them and probably thinking in your mind that this person's always angry all the time, 24 seven. He's just an angry person, a mean, angry person. When in reality, it might just be that situation of the traffic that, that, that is making that person angry in that one moment. And it's actually not a personality trait. This person, for all we know, could be the nicest person on earth. But just in that one moment of their life, they were feeling angry because of something in that situation. And so what happens yeah. is we make the, the error that we make in our mind is we, we think that this person is, is that person based on that situation instead of thinking that the situation caused them to act that way. So, yeah, it's, I guess it goes into the first impressions. Yeah, exactly. When you meet someone, you have a first impression, even though you don't meet them verbally or physically, maybe they hear about you. Then that, in a sense, is a first impression of you because that is the, the first time in their life that they hear about this person, this other friend of a friend or whoever it is. So yeah. in a sense, yes, it's kind of interesting how we tend to think about of a person's way of being on the first couple of and that's exactly things that we hear. I how think that's why people date, why, why you have to date, because when you meet someone, you can feel very attracted to them physically, or you just think that they're the most you know, charismatic person, but then you come to realize that, that they're human. And then you kind of bring them down from the pedestal that they seem like they are in your mind. And you realize that there's no status. There's no, there's actually all those things that or concepts that we have in our mind actually don't exist. They're actually just human beings. Right. We create all that in our mind. We create all these stories in our mind, yeah, but was, they all seem true until you actually understand the truth, come to find the truth. Yeah, until you get to know them. Like marriage changes. At first, it's the rose-colored glasses and honeymoon phase, but then it turns into something different. And then older couples will tell you have been married for decades that the marriage just turns into something else completely than it was in the beginning. Yeah. It's more into like a companionship rather than like a romantic thing because after that many years of knowing someone it becomes more of like you're reliant on each other or supporting each other in various ways financially uh practically you know health-wise anything really it kind of it, yeah it's more about like the physical attraction but then it turns into something way more um and also you know on another note on that attribution error, I think that's how a lot of stereotypes happen about people, mm -hmm. cultures, stereotypes about cultures, gender, race, anything. Yeah. Because you hear about them and then you are from others or you have your own ideas and you think more about them of their personality traits, their characteristics rather than who they are as a human being and their behaviors in a situation. So, you know, like your teacher may act a certain way in the classroom but that does not mean that's how your teacher acts when they're at home or, you know, at a bar for some crazy example. I don't know. Just making stuff up. So, yes. You know, so we may see our teacher as this person who's a certain way, but then we'd be so surprised if we ran into them at like a restaurant and they're acting so different, you know? Yes. So. And which has happened to me before seeing teachers at Walmart or HEB right. and realizing oh, they're human beings. But when I was little and saw them in the classroom, I would see them as this 
great authority figure. But when I would see them so casually at the store, for example, then that idea of them being such a high authority that I cannot reach seemed to just happen to be very close, right? Or more um, approachable. Yeah, exactly. I learned that when I when I did the stay in. Remember the what is it called? Uh, you know, were you staying with the priests at St. Mary's like that? Yes, it? yes, Casa, yes. Casa Maria, or what was it? Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, it's, it's uh, like you you come and see. Exactly, and I always had this. Uh, I guess I don't know view. I guess of priests as these authority figures who are like all perfect and stuff. And but when I stayed there with them for a week. You know, each morning and just during the day and throughout the day, just kind of off and on talking to them again to know them on a more personal level. I saw them more as human beings, you know, who are not perfect. And actually, I found that they're very relatable people, you know. And so it's really interesting when that happens. It changes your whole perspective. And so it's really cool because people have certain views about priests. They think like there's these big authority figures who are really strict, but in reality, they're just human beings who are pretty humble at least from my experience. I'm not saying my, that's the same as everyone else's, but that, that was just with those priests that I met. So so it really does make you question and think about how we how our minds work. And to me, what I take from it is like thinking more about the situation rather than thinking this person is a certain way. You know, instead of thinking, oh, this person is this or that, thinking more about, okay, this person is going through this situation right now and maybe the situation is causing them to act this way instead exactly. of- exactly. Yeah, yeah so. I have I, I was I was I happened to fall into this situation on Thursday or no on Wednesday where one of my friends had a fight with another friend because of text message messages that they sent each other. So that that was the first error. They should have talked about it over the phone, but that's how it happened. And then as I start hearing both sides of the story. I realize, and I talk to them, I start to realize where people are at in their life. And I understood the situation much better because I came to understand a person's side. So when, when somebody might say, oh, they were the right ones or they, that he was the, the one that was at fault with listening to each other and seeing that oh, he, this person reacted this way because that's how he processes information. Not only that, there's something that happened at home that affected uh, yeah. this and made him think that this other person was not taking things seriously or being childish, whatever it might be. So understanding that, and I think that it really takes emotional intelligence is perhaps the word to the context to yes to not take things out of context to be able to focus and put yourself in other people's shoes and honestly i think that's the way of life learning how to serve others is by understanding them and how they process information how they want to be served not how you think that they want to be served yeah, I think so too. Yeah, so I think <clears throat> my final thoughts on that is like taking that social psychology class where I learned a lot of this stuff from, it changed my perspective on so many things. And I started realizing that the mind doesn't know much about it its own self, you know? Like our mind has so many tricks and traps that we fall into and we don't realize that we do it every day and without realizing it, all the little mental errors and mistakes we make about what we think is true about the world and so i think for me it just made me more aware of it and more trying to like think about things more critically so that like that's my main takeaway i think nice yeah what about you like final like you know things or takeaways or yeah i think you hit it on the nail with the aspect of how our mind just can be not only easily deceived, but 
the aspect that it has those what some people might call them traps, but if you use them in the right way, they can actually be used for great good. So understanding that they are there can be an opportunity to use them for the greater good. Right. Exactly. Once you're aware of it, you can take control. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you guys for watching. The, um, let us know what you thought about uh, the conversation we had today in regards to all these interesting and weird ways that our mind works in i think that we there's a lot to to take from here and we would really like to know what are some things that you might have also gone through was there anything that resonated with you guys we will really love to know down below in the comment section and so until next time we will see you guys soon and take care